everybody. Uh, welcome to this week's Zoom chat. Uh, this week I am with the second horn of the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, Hugo Valverde, and I uh, hope that pronunciation was good. <laughs> and, uh, it was great. It was great. Hugo, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you on, and uh, thanks for agreeing to do this. And um, so anyway, welcome. And uh, just kind of wanted to start by asking you uh, sort of about your beginnings. Uh, you're from Costa Rica. Can you talk a little bit about how you started, what age you were, and like the circumstances around that? Sure. Well, thanks for, for you know, asking me and, you know, I'm, I'm excited to be here as, as a guest. And yeah, when I, when I was in Costa Rica, before I left to the U.S., um, you know, before I started at the music school in my hometown, I would always hear my dad play the trumpet. He's a, he's a, he's a trumpet player, not professional. But he, you know, he still plays. He's a business administrator. So I would always hear him practicing. I would always hear him playing tunes. And, um, you know, he would play concerts at churches with the community band. So I was always very close to, you know, like to music, you know, to concerts and especially brass playing. And... I would always grab the trumpet and then put the mouthpiece, uh, well, in, of course, in the lead pipe, but then also in the in the finger hook sometimes and, and say, oh, this is a tuba, because it would point upward, <laughs> you know, sort of like buzz. But I, but I could buzz. I could actually buzz the mouthpiece. And he, so he actually, when I was, when I turned six or seven, he enrolled me in the music school. So I started with solfege and just learning the how to read music and everything. And when when I was uh, must have been seven and a half or eight years old, then um, it was time for for instrument trials. And you know I had to give three options. And hey Jim, <laughs> I had to like give three options. And my first one was saxophone. But the baritone sax, the, the the big one. Then the second choice was tuba, and I did not have a third choice. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, I I went to the music school that day, and and they said, okay, well, what are your choices? And he said, oh, I want to play the saxophone. I want to play the big saxophone. And they said, well, you're too too small for that instrument right now. You would have to start with the alto sax. Well, we don't have any available alto saxophones right now, so uh, you can't play saxophone. I was like, okay. Second choice was tuba, and they only had one tuba, really dented one, you know, holes everywhere. But it was already taken by my cousin. Um, so they were like, what's your third option? I said, I don't have a third option. And then the, the director of the school said, um... Well, we have a French horn laying around if you want to try it. And I said, sure. I mean, I, I can't remember what the French horn looks like, but you know, I'll, I'll give it a try. And then he brought it. He opened up the case, and I said, oh, yeah, I'll play that. I'll, I'll, play, I'll play the horn. So that's how he started playing the horn. But wow. then, if funny enough, the horn did not have a mouthpiece. That horn that I started with didn't have a mouthpiece. So I thought the horn didn't work because I would try to like play it and then my I would tell my dad this horn doesn't work doesn't make any sounds so we ordered a mouthpiece from from Yamaha I still actually have it it's it's, it's like somewhere around here this was my very first mouthpiece wow That's Yamaha 32C4 yeah so we ordered this mouthpiece and then when it arrived I started playing and I didn't want to stop and that's how I started that's how I started with the horn. Wow. Yeah. So and uh, so before you picked an instrument, you were already doing solfege first, though, right? You said. Yes, uh, I did solfege and you know, music reading for about one year, one year, and then I started. Uh, yeah, that, with the that would that would never happen here right now. You know, in the states, that would have that would be unusual. I think. You know. Really. Oh yeah. The, we don't have those kind of early programs as much. I mean, a kid might sing uh -huh. in a choir, might play recorder, but solfege for that kid, that'd be very unusual. So that's, wow. you know, I mean, there, there are always differences in how you start, you know, when you're a kid and then how you start with, with music. 
But um, yeah, I mean, I started with Solfage and it was just, you know, when I started, it was easy for me to just, you know, read a, a piece of music and actually do the Solfage, not That's... only like C, D, E, and... Now, were no. you doing movable or fixed at that time? Uh, I was doing fixed, you know, like started with fixed, but then I started, you know, you started like transposing sometimes, you know, try to bring the melody uh, up a half step, down a half step, and then, and that's pretty much what I'm good at. <laughs> <laughs> well, that explains, but that explains your ears, right? I mean, like the that training at an early age, I mean, William Bacchiano had ear training for a year before he picked up a trumpet. You know, there's so many stories like that. And uh -huh. uh, it's wow. not as common now as it was a long time ago is what I'm saying, but that's amazing. So, uh, so what kind of music was playing in your house? I mean, you said your dad's dad still plays trumpet. What, do you remember any yeah. of those kind of influences you heard when you were young? He would, you know, he would play, you know, tunes, uh, a lot of Costa Rican tunes because, you know, they would play them in the community band. Uh, he has an Arban book. Uh, he's, I actually have it there. It's my, my dad's Arban's book. So he would play some of the exercises, you know, the articulation. He would play the characteristic etudes at the back of the book. So those are the tunes that I, you know, grew up listening to. So I was like... So, I mean, I know those tunes because of him wow. and also because of his colleagues. And... But I mean, I didn't know what it was until I read. Oh, it's it's, it's the Arban's Arban's book. Okay. So, now what yeah. was now? So when you started on horn, were there any horn players that you heard, or do you remember when you first started kind of developing that sound? Uh, well, there was a guy who was my my first teacher. His name is Daniel Daniel Leon. Um, he was studying with the principal horn of the orchestra here in Costa Rica, but then he's from the same hometown as me. So we live like five minutes apart, um, away from each other. And so he would bring me recordings of uh, solo albums. The first ever album that I heard was Herman Baumann playing the Glier Horn Concerto. That's the one I heard first and it was just, it, it was incredible. And I, it, it, he told me that I told him once that it sounded like the horn was about to explode. I was like, is he able to, to like hold that many notes? I mean, he's playing a lot of notes. He's, he's about to explode. That's yeah. what I told him when I first heard the concerto. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's easy to have that memory of the first time you heard really somebody do it right. Isn't it? You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great, and that's a great recording for somebody to first hear as a horn idea. I mean, oh, yeah. do you remember your horn playing like getting quite a bit better as soon as you heard that recording in a way well i mean it was when when i it was like six months after i started maybe a year because you know we did a lot of fundamentals but then we would do a lot of buzzing you know with, with this exact mouthpiece we would do we would just go buzz a g i do the horn and i remember just trying to hit the note and do it again and again and and that's how I remember I started, you know, just buzzing and oh. trying to translate that into the horn. And I think we're doing more long tones and playing tunes like the Bluebells of Scotland, that sort of, you know, short melodies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things like that. And how long did you yeah. study with him? I studied with him from 2003 until 2008. Um, cause I mean, in the, in the, in the middle of that, of those, uh, three, three, that's five years, you know, four years, I think I started with him for four years. Uh, he left to the U S to, to start his, his bachelor's at Loyola university. Mm -hmm. So I had a gap, you know, I, I, there was a time that I didn't have a teacher. So I sort of stayed the same and I didn't know what to practice. So. I had some periods of times that I that I wasn't doing anything, but then he would come back from, you know, for vacation, and then would we would have lessons. Yeah. And then in 2008, that's when I moved to the music National Music Institute of of Costa Rica. Yeah, and is that and is that where you studied with uh, Luis? Uh, Luis, Murillo? yeah, Luis Murillo is is the principal horn of the orchestra in Costa Rica. And he's a great teacher, a great guy, and a great friend of mine. 
Yeah. yeah. Also, my bike, mountain biking companion. He, we <laughs> just, you know, we go on, on tours up the hill, but not now because we're all inside, indoors. But uh, yeah, I started with him, and it was great. It, it was farther, so it was really difficult sometimes just to 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 go all the way there because it's it's located in the outskirts of San Jose, towards the south of the capital. It's in the completely opposite direction of where I live, so. It would take a long time sometimes. Now, people who are, are watching this should realize you're in Costa Rica right now since Oh since yeah. COVID. I should I should have pointed that out. Yeah. So you guys are you guys are seeing each other right now, I assume, while you're down there a little bit. Uh, uh I saw him once. You know, I went down to his to his house. Uh well you mean during quarantine or Yeah. Have you guys yeah, seen I, I've seen him once and it was because I, I needed I wanted to try some mouthpieces and he's got a lot of mouthpieces and he said oh I've got a bunch so just come come down and I'll give you a box with the mouthpieces so he handed the box and then I went back home but then we chatted for a little bit but we didn't you know yeah you're being careful have... of course yeah did, did, so. now what uh, so what materials changed from just like the basics that you're working on before toward more serious material at that age um, well, you know, like both Daniel and Luis, they were very advocate, advocates of fundamentals. Mm -hmm. So we did a lot of that. And then we do, we would do melodies, you know, we would play Coprash number one, the first book. And then also there's a method called, uh, Potag, Max Potag. Max Potag. Yeah. Max Potag. Yeah. We would play melodies from, from those. And then just play them articulated, slurred, um, in different various dynamics, and yeah. Now, did you do any routines like like singer or any of those kind of things that a lot of horn players do? Farkas. Uh, or... I I did not. I learned about singer when I was doing my bachelor's. When I was getting my bachelor's, but I didn't do singer here in Costa Rica. Maybe I did with Luis. Maybe, you know, we did some exercises, but I wasn't aware what Zinger was. You know, there was a horn method and, you know, but yeah. Embouchure Building, that's the name. Embouchure Building by Joseph Singer. Right. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I was, I was always curious because I know horn players, you have, a, we all have like the basic things we use and you guys have your set of things and I know that Singer is yeah. one of them. So, I like to throw that word out when I can. Definitely one of them, yeah. <laughs> so you studied, you studied with him for uh, for a couple of years, and then you went to uh, Lynn University in Miami, and studied with uh, Gregory Miller. Can you kind of talk about that transition coming to the states and and uh, what kind of situation yeah. that was? Uh, yeah, in Costa Rica, I spent uh, four years with Luis. And then, you know, when I started getting better and when I was able to play more, more things, you know, more difficult, more challenging stuff, he would bring me to the orchestra a lot. He would, you know, have me as an assistant, you know, assistant horn. And sometimes he would, he would say, um, just, just play second. It's Jim saying <laughs> something. Yeah. Just play second right now. And. It, so I, I was I was immersed in like submerged immersed yeah. in, in the orchestral setup very early on, and there was one time that the Glier Horn Concerto was scheduled for the orchestra, and originally Luca Benucci was gonna play the solo part, Italian horn player, but then about three weeks before or a month he had to cancel because you know there was a problem with with the permission you know just getting the the uh the permit to to leave italy to come to costa rica so my teacher called greg he called greg miller and he said hey greg uh we're doing the glier in a month i hope you can join us if if not that's okay and and greg said yes i'll, I'll come down and play the glier so when he was here um i had already tell I had already told Luis that I wanted to study abroad, you know, even if in the U.S. or Europe. I just wanted to leave the country because, you know, I already wanted to to see what was out there, you know, outside the Costa Rican uh, borders. 
Yeah. And Luis said, well, you know, the, Greg is coming. You should ask him for a lesson. Ask him if you can play for him. And But then my English wasn't that good at, at that time, so he really had to help me with translation and just going up to him and asking. Um, if Greg is watching this, he, <laughs> he will remember, yeah. And, and yeah, after a rehearsal, I went up to him and I said, hey, I would love to play for you. And, and he said, you know, we're about to go get lunch with, with some of your, you know, with your teacher. But yeah, I have like 20, 30 minutes. And then those 20 minutes turned into two hours. He actually canceled his lunch and he said, no, 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 I'm going to stay here. And, and then two hours later, he, he said some things that I can't remember because I couldn't understand. Yeah. And, and then the next day, my teacher said, Greg wants you to go study with him at Lynn. And so we're going to do the process. If, if your parents are okay with it, then you're going to go to, to Lynn in August. And I mean, I was very excited. It was just really hard to process. And I said, yes, right away, I'll do whatever. I'll just, you know, pack everything up, leave the country. <laughs> wow. Wow. But yeah, it was like that. So it was, uh, but the admission process was already way past. You know, this was around um, April or May of 2012. So the admissions are in December or February, something like that. So he had to go back to the U.S., call Lynn and ask them if, if there was a spot left. And they said, yeah, there, there is a spot and there is a scholarship. Uh, it, it would be for him. So I got it. I got approved. And so then I had to go to the embassy, get the visa, uh, do the TOEFL test for, you know, the English proficiency test and, and all that. You, but, you know, yeah, I really had a, a limited amount of time because I had to be there in August and it was already May. So I really had like. A, a very short amount of time to just get all those things done and and get you know mentally ready for that yeah wow that's that's a lot of, of stuff to do you have to get the language together take the exam yeah, yeah. pack your bags and go and uh so what was that transition like from going from costa rica to the united states as far as as far as the horn the horn playing part i guess is yeah most of yeah, I mean, it, it was very exciting, you know, a lot, it was challenging, lots of challenges in, in the way for sure, but, you know, they helped me to, you know, sh they helped me to shape me as a person and also as a musician, both, you know. Right. And um, Greg, you know, he was starting with Greg was great because, again, he's really into fundamentals and getting the basics, you know, the foundation of horn playing really well. And it was very good for me, you know, like doing routines next to him, you know, we would do them together and having the reference right next to you was, is, is great. I, I'm, I'm a hundred percent, you know, a believer that you, we need to have a, a, a good example right next to us when we're learning, especially, you know, in bachelor's first two years, play along with your teacher. And, and that's one of the things that he did and that really helped me to improve my whole play, my, my horn playing, my range. Uh, because in, when I was in Costa Rica, I would always play, you know, like Mozart Concerti, the etudes. And I didn't have, let's say that I didn't explore my low range until mm -hmm. I went to the US. Then I started playing low horn stuff and I was like, oh, this, is, this isn't this is that hard for me to do. So I started working on a lot of, a lot of, of on low horn and then I started just you know you know working up the range you know but what kind of things do you remember that helped you expand your range I would just the the first thing that I always tell people is scales you know start them from the low range up to the high range and then up down to the high, high low range and just doing that back and forth you know trying to expand uh, you know, progressively and slowly, you just, you know, with a lot of patience, I would, you know, do my routines like this. For example, two days, I would start uh, a C major scale, would go up the octave, but then I would play up to an F. 
you know, like scales up to an F and wait until that F was, you know, solid and very, until it had the sound that I wanted. Then I would go one step. I would go up to G. And then we'll work all the way up to the high C. But then I would go really slow. But then that really helped me to, to build a lot of endurance and strength. Yeah. But sometimes, you know, it was you know, a little reckless the way I would do it. And, you know, Greg would say, hey, you know, we we, we got to talk about the routines a little bit. And so what, what would be in your routines at that point? What was the sort of the order or the procedure with how you guys would play back and forth? Um, it, at, at Lynn, I played a lot of Maximal Fons. Um, I played Galet. I played a lot of Arban exercises, articulation exercises. Greg has this great exercise that is just a five note scale. And you do that three times and then you go up a half step until you hit a high C and then you, you can either keep going or I would try to keep going, you know, like maybe C sharp, high D. I mean, they, they wouldn't sound very good at that point, but then I would try to get the notes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, just, just building endurance, building. Uh, and was, yeah, I mean, was there a lot of flexibility in that process too? Uh, I'm not very good at, um, you know, doing really fast drills, you know, flexibility. Yeah. For me, flexibility has to do with being able to play both ranges with your same uh, tone, mm -hmm. timbre. Timbre, is that how you say it in yeah, English? Yeah, timbre, yeah. Timbre. And, and keeping the same sound. That's, for me, that's being flexible, you know, like playing high and low and still sounding like the same person. Right. I right. would, you know, do flexibility exercises, but not too fast because they were always challenging. For example, I cannot do it. I mean, I, I can do it like, yeah. but too fast, I can't. It's just something that I've always struggled with. <laughs> That's worked out for you, though, so far. It was when you right when you were when you're talking about playing in the different ranges. Um, yeah. Is your crossing over like shift points or breaks? Was that ever an issue or anything that you had to kind of work out? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I still have some some shifts here and there, but uh, not so much about really doing an ambush or change. It's just about just adjusting the jaw. Yeah, that's something that I realized when when I really when I sat down. There was one day that I sat down and I said, I'm gonna really analyze my the way I play. And this wasn't too long ago, like maybe less than two years ago. I said, I'm, I'm going to see what, what I do when I play this in this range, in the high range. And there isn't so much like an ambusher change. I just adjust the jaw a lot. For example, I always tell people when I discover this, uh, if you, for example, do this, oh, 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 oh you move your jaw to get a better sound right because if you keep the jaw in the same place oh it sounds bad right so that's what i do with my with my jaw not so much about the ambusher i just adjust it so it sounds better and but that's it what it sounds pretty but it sounds like it sounds like a very natural movement though like are you thinking about that while you're playing or are you just kind of uh, noticing it I, I wasn't aware of that, but now I am. Now I, I'm, what I'm trying to do is like maybe include more movement. If, if more movement is going to give me a better sound, then I, I will go for that because it's, it's all about sound. And let's say I do less movement. Uh, it's, it's more efficient, but the sound is not quite there. Then I won't do it. I won't in, stick with it. So. Right. It's always, it's always about the sound and, and that I'm sure that jaw movement kind of is just natural after a little bit, right? Because you've been so sound oriented. Yeah. Um, so what, uh, so that was, that was a lot of what you did at Lynn was just a lot of basics and what, what kind of uh, solo repertoire were you playing at that time too? Um, yeah, well, I, we worked on, you know, solo rep, uh, for example, clear, we worked on the motor concerti. I did a lot of brass quintet at Lynn, um, because, you know, the, it, I think brass quintet is, is something really 
remarkable in, in that school because, you know, the faculty, Mark Rees, for example, yeah. he played in the Empire Brass, also Greg, uh, Ken Amis on, on tuba, trombone, yeah, yeah. Dan Satterwhite, and if he's watching, you know, hello, yeah. all of them. But, you know, you know, Brian, Brass Quintet really helped me too, just to like have the brass sound always around me and like trying to be more solid and, and then playing in the orchestra there. Um, I never won the concerto competition when I was in school, but I prepared some solos here and there. I prepared the Mozart concerti. And then um, in my recital, I played Strauss second horn concerto. Um, and, and those when those are the ones that I worked, but then I, since, since I started, you know, when, as I went with my studies at Rice and then at the Met, I would always try to learn new rap, you know, in, in the, in my spare time, maybe work on the f opening phrase of, uh, a Telemann concerto or, um, Leopold Mozart. I mean, those are really tough horn parts, really high up and, uh, yeah. you know. But, you Same know, with just try to like <laughs> dig more into the, to those, you know. Yeah. Because that's not always what you're, you're doing now on your job. You're trying to balance thing, things out, I'm guessing, right? When you're playing that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I try, I try, you know, when I'm, when I'm playing in the opera, um, you know, a second horn, you know, you really have to have a lot of flexibility, you know, you got to play low and high right. and, uh, but you know, for me, I, I, I would feel much better if I can play, if I know that I can play a low C, a mid middle C and a high C in the same day with no problem, you know, not that I'm going to use them, but I just want to make sure they are there. So every day I cover the entire range. Yeah. yeah just you know, play scales and if the, if the notes are there, then I'm I'm okay. I'm gonna feel calm in the morning. Right. And then it, sometimes and then... it's not. Sometimes it's not that way. Sometimes you're not gonna feel as good, but you know you still try to make it work somehow. Yeah. And then you trust that after you take a walk or whatever, it it gets better. <laughs> sometimes well, yeah exactly i mean when when things are not sounding good then that's my excuse to go out for a walk go for for a coffee at, at joe coffee which is excellent coffee near lincoln center and i'm sure jim knows it <laughs> yeah i'm sure he does yeah and so so you were there at land for four years and then uh and then you went to rice where you studied with uh bill vermulen so that's let's definitely talk about that because that guy's got such an amazing track record as a teacher and a player, obviously just a total monster. What yeah, was, yeah. what was, what was, what was that about? What was that like? What, where, where did you go next in your playing once you got to rice? Yeah. Well, when, when I started at rice, um, I must say it wasn't easy. I mean, I've told this many times to, and to people that when I heard the rest of my classmates, I was like, Wow, like holy moly, I'm I'm the worst one here. I, I really need to get my things together and try to try to learn from them. And you know, in a lesson with with Bill, he said, "Well, you're here because you bring something special that they will learn from." And the same with the rest of your classmates. You know, like if I picked anyone, let's say that was very good at high range, then what's the point? What, like, you guys won't learn anything about low range, but you're really good at this, 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 and that. The other person is really good at this, 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 and that. And he said, you know, you will, you know, have one or two lessons weekly with me, but most of the time you will be with, with the rest of your classmates. And that's where you're gonna learn a lot. So you really have to go with big ears, listen and try to ask, try to learn from them try to copy the good stuff. And uh, I took that very personally, you know, I, I would always ask them and you can ask any of them that were at rise at the same time. I would annoy them by the amount of questions, but you know, it, it, I would ask because they would do things better than I did. And I said, I'm, I'm struggling with that. So I'm just going to ask how they do it. And I still do. I, I, for example, with my colleagues at the Met, I asked them, you know, it's like, for example, with my colleague, Eric, the principal horn, I, I ask him a lot of questions to Javier, to Barb, and to the rest of the section. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. there are nine horn players there. So, I mean, I, I definitely ask a lot of them about information, and I try to include that in, in my playing. It always seems like that. But it, it was like that. 
Oh, I was just going to say, it say? always seems like that, that Medhorn section has generally had a very good like vibe to it over the years where you can oh, it's great. do that, where you can do that. It's a great group of people. Um, I mean, I, I love them. It's, it's a great section and they, I will be forever grateful with them because they really helped me to get comfortable in, in, you know, playing opera, playing in the orchestra. Cause I mean, I never played an opera before joining the Met. <laughs> so um, I, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to prepare the audition, but I never played an opera that, and so when I won it, I was like, that's great. But I, I freaked out right away because I said, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I mean, I knew this is rep that I never played before. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, before we get too far into the Met, tell, talk about um, what kind of things you worked on with Remulin and, and what was his audition preparation like? I mean, I've always heard, like, did he call you in the middle of the night and tell you to play an excerpt? I mean, these stories. Is that true? <laughs> I heard those stories, but he didn't do it with me. No, we, we, that didn't happen when I was at Rice. But it was always, you know, very thorough work with every excerpt, each aspect of specific aspects on each excerpt and also the mental game, you know, I, that's the most important part. Uh, he would make you believe that you are the best candidate that day for the, for the audition, because if you don't go with that mentality, then once you hear something, let's say intimidating, that will eventually get into your mind and it will affect you. It will, you know, make you more nervous. I'm not saying that, you know, it, you know, it depends on each person, but um, it's it's just hard to adapt. And and he would, you know, he would ask us, but not not ask us. Um, just that playing for each other is is the most important thing. Playing for different people and to be always to 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 play the you know as regular as regularly as we could, for example, play for mock auditions for them, play for other faculty members, play excerpts, play solos, but, you know, be constantly playing in front of people. So you so you get used to that feeling of uh, them having some feedback of, of whoever you're playing for having some comments. Because I, I think one of the big mistakes that people who take auditions do is that they don't play for enough people they they only practice in the practice room and once they go take the audition then the, the mental part is it, it it becomes a problem it, they, it it just consumes them and then they uh, all, all of a sudden forget how to play right so the, the mental preparation and, and that's a way that's one way that he 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 actually used a lot you know like you know having us play for each other uh, in studio classes, we, we would, you know, start studio class with playing a song, you know, not an excerpt. He would say, just play a tune, play whatever you want, play it. And, you know, at first, you know, we would play very, you know, very square and, and, and sort of like lots of mistakes. But as we went on, you know, you could hear that everyone started enjoying playing the tune even more. So you actually are comfortable playing the tune. So he said... Try to go, go to the auditions and do that, you know, you know, feel comfortable, feel like you're just playing a tune. You're just playing music for, for, for them. Don't be, don't be like too much, like inside your hair thinking, oh, it's, it's an audition and I must, I must do well. I must not miss notes. It's maybe put that aside and just enjoy playing, playing music. Yeah. And it was always about that. Yeah, it's, it's anybody I've known that's ever stayed with him, they always have confidence, you know, but it, it seems like a healthy confidence, you know, it's, it's good. Were there any, yeah, well, you know, like, for, for... no, sorry, sorry. No, no, I was going to ask if there were any, any, like, were there any books he had you read or were there any, any processes he went through as far as gaining that or visualizing the audition? Um, well, you know, he, he would give us a lot of, um, advice you know he, he reads a lot of books actually but I'm, I'm not a very good reader shame with me i don't read a lot of books and um but i read i actually did read the inner game of tennis that's a, it's just a classic for people who are you know trying to 
be better at taking auditions or performing as a soloist. I read that book and it helped me a lot just to compare what the guy did and try to include that in my routines. But um, I would just try to, you know, play for as many people as possible. That's, that's something I did a lot at Rice. And I would, even if it was only an excerpt, I would ask whoever was walking in the hallway, say, hey, can I play an excerpt for you? So I would always do that. Yeah. So yeah. By, by the time you're starting, you're going to start taking auditions, you won't feel that pressure very much right. because you're used to that. You're used to playing in front of a, a, an audience, uh, in front of a committee, for example. Because if you don't do it, then you're, you're never going to get used to it. And even more so when you have like 4,000 people in front of you. Right. Like for the Met, for example. I mean, still nerve wracking at times, but you know, I'm, I've learned how to be in control of that. And yeah. that's how I did it. Yeah, uh, that's excellent. I mean, and how many auditions yeah. did you take before the Met? Do you remember? Or do you want to say? I took four. Four. Two, four auditions, and the Met was the fifth audition. Yeah. And Fantastic. And, it, and as you did them, did you notice, was it a, a kind of a steady progression or were there like a little, some peaks and valleys along the way about how they went? Because um, only having had, four, that's, you know, that's pretty good, you know. Well, I, I was, I was very like, you know, I, I, again, in my, in my year at Rice, I always tried to absorb as, as much information as possible. So I would ask a lot of questions. I would play with my colleagues, um, play with my classmates, sorry, and and try to ask, you know, ask questions, say, how do you do that? Um, so that we would, I would buy them coffee and say, Let, let's go to the coffee house and I'll buy you coffee and we'll, we will talk about your, your secrets. I mean, they're, they're not secrets, they, it's just what they do, what they, usually do but they i would ask them can you just explain that to me mm -hmm. so i did that a lot and i would just go and try to try it you know give it a try to see what worked what didn't work for me and yeah that's and tell and, and tell us about like uh the day you won the met which has probably got to be like one of the best days of your life you know oh it was great oh sorry actually well i actually oh, yeah. didn't finish the with, with the auditions, uh, but, but when I started taking the auditions, the first one was actually surprisingly good. Uh, the first audition I took, I made it to the finals. <laughs> and, and I was like, okay, well, I wasn't expecting this. It was a, 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 in Florida. It took the first audition was in, in Florida. And then I was like, okay, well, I mean, I, I spent the entire month of December preparing for that audition. And I actually had to fly to Florida on December 31st. That, it was, that wasn't fun. I actually, you know, celebrated the, the new year in the plane. <laughs> so it, it was a little depressing. But, you know, it, it's a sacrifice. You just got to do it. When, when you commit to do that, then you just got to do it. And then the second audition was uh, in Arizona. Then the third one was in, in Florida. Then I took one in, wait, no, no, three of them were in Florida. So Florida, Arizona, Florida, and then I did uh, New York for the Met. So the Met was the fifth one. And three weeks before I took the Met audition, I, I, I took an audition in, in, in Florida, in Sarasota. And it was for, for Second Horn mm -hmm. and... Um, but then I, I was the runner up. So they, and the fourth horn had just resigned. So they, they offered me the fourth horn job. And I said, sure, I mean, I, it's a job. I, I really want to start, you know, playing in an orchestra. But then three weeks later, I was lucky enough to, to get the, the med job. So it was, it, it was tough. I had to call them and like, hey, I just wanted to tell you that I, I won this. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for, you know, like, you know, offering me that, I will be, you know, very grateful with them. Yeah, but I'm sure they understood. Oh, yeah, yeah, they, they, they actually <laughs> wrote me a, a very nice email, and, you know, I replied with an, another, you know, yeah. email.
So, so what was the day like when you when you uh, won the Met? Can I talk through like when you woke up, what, where your mind was? How did you? I mean, like you know, like all the things we do on auditions, where like we manage like how we eat, how we sleep, when we want to warm up, yeah. how much you do, all those kind of things. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not very systematic in that in that matter. Um, mm. I sort of just go with the flow. I I mean, try not to go crazy. But something funny that happened uh, the night before the final round. Yeah, I mean, semis and then finals. <laughs> I was staying with, with a friend of my dad, a Costa Rican guy who lives in, in Harlem, 137th Street. So I was staying at his apartment. He had a, an extra room, very small. You know, I barely fit in there. And I played the the first round. Then I, I you know, I, I made the cut. I went to the second round but then I had to wait a day and you know in that day I, I didn't play much I mean I played my routine I played some skills but I didn't play the excerpts the day before I didn't want to fix things you know I knew that what I prepared was what I had and it was impossible to to fix something the day before so I just didn't play any excerpts I would play the, the first two or three notes of the excerpts and that was it yeah. And the ending. I would play the beginning and the end of the excerpt. That's it. Just to make sure I started well and ended well. Yeah. And whatever was going to happen in the middle. So the night before the the semi finals, uh, he brings a six pack of beers and <laughs> and it's like, Hey, we'll celebrate because they, they, they chose you, right? Yeah, you made it I was like, Well, you know, I'm I'm gonna play the next day. And he goes, oh, we'll celebrate. So he, he opened a beer, and I was like, oh, boy, okay. <laughs> so I, ha I had a couple. I had actually three beers. You know, that, but then I actually had to tell him, hey, I'm, I'm, I, can't, I can't keep drinking because I have to play tomorrow, and I, I don't want to mess this up. I don't want to mess up. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, but, you know, it didn't affect me much. I just got a little nervous because of, you know, he was like, oh, let's celebrate, celebrate. But then I... When I won the audition, then I went back and then we celebrated. Right. And yeah, it was funny. And then I got up really early that day. I got up at like 6 a.m. I just couldn't, I couldn't sleep. So I got up at 6. I went for a walk around the block. And then I warmed up with my practice music because he was still sleeping. And then he, he left for work. And then I walked all the way from 137 down to Lincoln Center. It was a long walk. <laughs> yeah, that's a long walk. I just looked up in, 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 the, in the map, in Google Maps, and I was like, okay, this is Broadway. I literally just have to go down the street until just, I see the man. Just so like just 70 blocks. It was at, I think it was like 11 a.m. that I, we had to be there or something like that. Yeah, so, I mean, I left at... 8 a.m. I was leaving, you know, ready, showered, and got started walking. And I got there, you know, with, with a lot of time in advance. And played again in, in the, you know, we draw the numbers. We were in the, in the, in the practice rooms there. And, uh, you know, I hear people playing some excerpts here and there. And, but I'm, I'm not playing the excerpts. I'm just there, you know, again, just making sure I'm starting the notes here and there. Try not to freak out before I go and, and play the excerpt. Because, I mean, if you play an excerpt before you have to play it in the audition, it's sort of like, okay, that's how it's going to go. And what if it goes really bad? Then you are going to go to the audition thinking about that, that you messed up. So I prefer not to play excerpts the day of the audition. Then I, I just play it. You know, I, I, I remember I actually have the binder with, with the lists and the music not here it's in new york but yeah um, jim sorry <laughs> <laughs> and yeah i mean i i just went and played i took the time in be between each excerpt you know some things were good some others were not as good but you know i always tried to to keep going i didn't stop playing the excerpts because <clears throat> you know it, it's okay if we make mistakes in in, in auditions but what counts is the way you recover from them. The way, if you miss a note, then try to stay calm, try to 
you know, don't let that affect the rest of the excerpt because if you miss a note and then from there the intonation goes everywhere and then your sound you start getting shaky. So I mean, it's that's why it's good to play for people because you can't stop when you're doing a mock audition or playing a concert. Uh, I treat I treated a lot of my practice sessions like that, you know, not to stop, just play through, and if there were any mistakes, try to fix them afterwards. So, I'm, I of course I made mistakes, but I always tried to recover from them and finish. Do you, you, know, do you as remember if what nothing was, happened? Do you remember what, what was on that? Do you remember what was on that round, the final round? Uh, yeah, I started with with Mahler nine and. I it actually, you know, in Mahler 9, there was a funny story. I I was playing and then I missed a note in, you know, and it was like, and that actually got into, it got in my mind a little bit. And I was like, okay, this is the very first excerpt of the final round. And I just messed up and it wasn't, I wasn't happy about it. And, and I finished and I said, okay, a, a good chance for me it, right now is to, to play the last slur, the interval very musical but are you just like that slur because sometimes you 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 airball it yeah and then i say okay whatever i just missed that note but let's concentrate in that and i finished the excerpt and and i'm not gonna lie i was waiting for them to say oh thank you you know you missed messed up but then they didn't say anything jim was there yeah and <laughs> And then I, I look to the proctor and he, he goes, you know, sort of like keep going. And then I started playing. And then from that second excerpt, then I I said, okay, just bring your A game on, you know. And then Rosen Cavalier was there. Uh, Ryan Gold was there. Posca. Uh, what else? I can't remember. But the very last excerpt was the the vaults from Rosen Cavalier. Excuse my singing. It's oh, it's really good. good. But um, yeah, and, and and I just, I remember that last note I played and I was like, okay, well, this is it. But then I got up and left and, you know, waited a little bit and, and, and then the, the orchestra manager goes upstairs and, and he goes well number two wins and i was number two and, and you know what when, when when he said that i just you know i could froze and, and i i couldn't react and and the proctor told me i i wish i had a camera i wish i had my phone so i could actually take a picture of your reaction or a video of the way you reacted because it was just priceless <laughs> you know we're not allowed to use our phones in, in the audition um and, and yeah, I mean, it's a day that I, I carry in my, in my, you know, I cherish, cherish a lot that, that day, you know, it's a day that I will never forget because it's, it's like, it's like a dream coming true. It's basically a dream coming true. So yeah, it's, it's, it's very special. So yeah. it's always and then going downstairs and then when they open the doors and then you see the, you know, basically the people you have always admired. I mean, I still admire them very much. But, you know, I remember when I was at Lynn, I would watch their ring cycle video and I, I would see all of them. And then when I saw them there, I was like, this is just surreal right now. This is just unbelievable. I, I can't believe it. Wow. And yeah, it's. And then it's you great. celebrate. It's always good to go back to that day and remember, you know, when, when whenever I'm feeling a little sad, a little down, I think about that and try to recover. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's an amazing day. If you win an audition, there's no feeling like that, you know. Oh, it's, it's just great. I mean, the especially best. you know, you you go there and try to do your best and try to. Um, it, I, I mean, I always went and say, oh, hopefully this is what they're looking for, and hopefully I'm I'm the best candidate that day. But I, I can't decide for myself. You know, I just did what I could and. Well, Jim, Jim Ross just commented. He said it was a great day for us as well. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah I mean, I, I always hear from friends of mine on committees that, you know, they're, they're pulling for everybody. It's, it's quite the opposite of what I think we think a lot of in the audition chair where they're looking to eliminate, but really they're looking for somebody to win. So that's, 
you know. Yeah. So so what so you get the job and then and then the job starts. Can you talk about like do you remember the first opera you played with the Met? Yeah, very much. Uh the very first opera was the Magic Flute. Um James Levine was still conducting. It, it, in fact was my very very first opera, you know. It was with with him and then um but yeah, I mean I remember Jim was there, Jim was playing, uh, and I remember the, the very first rehearsal. Um, we actually matched, uh, the, Eric and I, the mm -hmm. same color shirt, same color of, of pants. Uh, we're just, you know, we're in the same, the same colors. <laughs> yeah. Match. Yeah. Oh, and I remember awesome. going there and I was like, because it's funny, uh, and the guy who won the timpani audition, two weeks before my audition at the Met, also went to Lynn. We went to Lynn. We were there for almost two years. And we were there. He was sitting over there, and I was sitting, and I looked at him like, holy cow. Like, I've, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm freaking out. I, I actually stood up and went up to, to him and said, I'm freaking out. If, if anything happens, just do not remind me of this day, please. But if it, if it goes well... <laughs> Let's go for a beer afterwards. We went for a beer anyways. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I remember the very first note that I played. And uh, it was just like, holy shit. <laughs> Sorry. Right. No, no, you can definitely say I it. have to say it. It's, just it's like, okay. Yeah, no, it's – that must – that yeah, that must have been amazing. And, and you still had Levine at that point. And, and yeah. uh, so can you talk a little bit about, you know, your role as second horn and how do you do certain things like – because, you know, some people that are watching this are probably students. Uh, how do you match an octave? How do you match a unison? What, what kind of things are you listening for? What kind of adjustments are you generally making when you're playing second? Uh, well, when you play second horn, what you want to do is to make the, make the first horn feel good. You know, don't have to worry about intonation. Don't have to worry about the, you know, the intervals being in tune. Um, you know, since I never played in, in like an opera like the Met Orchestra, orchestra like the Met Orchestra before, then, you know, like Eric really helped me a lot just to feel comfortable. We would talk about things and, uh, but the most important thing is the flexibility, you know, like whenever you need to play softer, that you can play softer right away. Whenever that you need to play, you know, just like knowing the intervals like you know knowing the tendencies of the intervals right away for example a fifth basic you play little but it depends maybe someone might be playing a little flat so you just adjust that's what the second horn does you know look, adjustments and do them right away yeah and you know um i don't know if michelle is watching right now but i've learned so much from her uh, definitely a person who helped me to feel more comfortable because mm -hmm. She's the one who retired, and to re—I mean, you can't replace Michelle, but right. you know, I, I told her, well, you know, big shoes to fill in for sure. So I talked to her a lot, and she, when it, when I heard her play, I was like, it's like you know, she knows what the pe the person will do, so she adjusts right away, and that's what what a great second horn does. You know, it sort of reads the mind of the first horn and adjusts you know by the time the person breathes i mean by the way the person breathes and you sort of go with that and in practicing that is really important you know practicing intonation practicing soft playing practicing soft entrances um practicing intonation is just some some of the basics that you need to have every day what, because, what kind of things do you do to practice those at home do you practice with drones or do you sing a lot or I, I, I practice with drone. I like to put the, the, the cello drones and just play intervals, you know, scales. Even, even if the interval is not, you know, consonant, just try to tune it. You know, try to see with, with the vibration. If it starts vibrating a lot, it means that it's out of place. So, I mean, just getting, get used to the, getting used to that. Um, doing a lot of different articulation exercises, you know, like more pointed articulations, sort of like very controlled breath attack and do that in both ranges. Um, 
it, it depends where you, on what you're playing, but then that's the basic thing, you know. Yeah. Flex, be flexible and always try to play softer, you know. Even if you think that you're playing very soft, try to go farther and try to explore more and like how to be more comfortable while playing softer. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's, that, I think that's the biggest thing, you know, playing very soft and then support the first horn, but then when the first horn dis, uh, plays really soft, I mean, you really have to match that and not cover the person. And it's something that I really had to work with because I wasn't very good at playing, playing soft, but um, I've gotten better and yeah. it's a work in progress. Wow. It seems like it's working out. Did, um, now you guys well, have, <laughs> well, and, and the Met, of course, the schedule is so much different than like a regular symphony orchestra schedule where you don't have a masterworks and that's the basic thing. Or, you know, a lot of orchestras obviously have like a masterworks and like a children's concert or pops concert the same week, but you guys are having a different show almost every night of the week yeah. when you, and, and and I would imagine that the rehearsal schedule is not, you don't have as many rehearsals as an orchestra would if they just have a regular masterworks for that opera because yeah. you've gone through it so much. How much uh, time did you spend with score study or how much of it was like just holding on a little bit by the seat of your pants, you know, in the beginning? Well, well, or combination? Well, you know, when, you, when I first started, you know, just the, first of all, being living in New York City, uh, such a great city, great place. Uh, I miss it very much right now. And, you know, but at the same time, then, you know, playing with the man and knowing that the standards that are really high, you know, like it's a great orchestra and a lot of people always want to, you know, just, you know, you want to cooperate. You want to be part of that uh, high standard. So you need to really work on your, on your craft, work on your playing, shape everything about your playing work on your weaknesses but also learning the music um the way i would do it is i never for example i would rarely listen to the entire opera in one day you know in one night i would try to get the score and then try to listen to a section or a, or an act and try to listen to a sec if it was a section i would listen to it uh, more than once at least twice and try to you know follow you know like maybe highlight what i needed to listen to uh right. you, you know the first horn of course you want to hear the lion but then what's going on around and actually visually see it it's you know it's kind of redundant but if you see it then you, it, it's even more clear right. so um having the score there um do it in sections and old or sometimes you know play along you know play along that small section if it was really confusing here and there, try to play along. If it's not possible to, with the recording, then you just try to acknowledge it in a different way. Yeah. But, you know, I, I like to do that in sections. You know, if I'm learning a new opera, let's say Monday, I'm going to listen to the half of the first act, maybe the first act if it's not too long. And then Tuesday, second act, uh, Wednesday, first and second sort of combined or and then third act you know sort of like don't let the the job that you did the work you did let, try not to forget it try to keep it fresh and that way when you when you go to the first rehearsal it is there it's hopefully you worked on it um but for example if it's a really extensive opera like like the ring operas that i i played for the first time last year that was uh, really a lot of work to do, and it wasn't, I mean, it was fun to play, but to prepare, it was uh, a, a little stressful because there's a lot of music, and you know that the conductor won't stop if, if you played something wrong. Right. And especially when they know the opera so well. And I was like, okay, first time for me, but my job is to make it sound like I, I, have, I have played it before. Yeah. So um, I remember uh, having dinner once with uh, with Michelle. Uh, oh, you froze up a little bit there. There we go. I don't know. I, I can see your. There we go. Now I got you. You're back. Is it, okay. Okay. Yeah. Now I got you. Now I got you. That happens sometimes. Now you froze. Oh, 
Oh, here we are. Here we are. We're back. Okay. We're back. Okay, we're back. That's the we're internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. It's That's just okay. Maybe internet. So you were saying internet you had dinner problem. with Michelle? You were talking about? I had dinner with Michelle, and and I was like, well, you know, we're about to play the ring, and she and she said, you better be practicing like crazy, you know. And, and the way she said that, I was like. Well, I mean, that's the only way, you know, practice, you know, really practice every day, learn the legs, learn the transportation, transportation, because you have to transpose a lot. And yeah, just like knowing what, what was happening. Um, you know, that that's like the biggest work I've done so far at the Met, learning the ring. But uh, when you were learning I mean, better, you were also once you play with the orchestra, Oh, I was, I was, I'm sorry. I was going to ask sorry, you, you, when, were you were learn, when you were working on the ring, did you also need to learn the story? Did you find that helpful or was that just too much? Uh, a little bit. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it was, I mean, it was, for example, too much, but I read the story. I mean, there, there are some things I can't remember right now, but I would, for example, try to read was uh, what that scene was about. So I would read it and then like, okay, this is what's going on. And uh, th that would also help the way you're going to, approach how to work on, on an excerpt. For example, if it's a very tender moment, then you don't want to play really loud with a zing in your sound. You know, you, you want to, you know, sort of fit in the, in the atmosphere. So if you know what's going on in the opera, then you will know how to fix it and how to adjust. Yeah. But uh, if you only play notes, oh, here I am, boom, 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 that, then, you know. Yeah. Very different. That's why the, my colleagues in the are great because I mean they, they they I mean the orchestra is great so I mean I miss I miss them now. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm sure. Um, and and uh, with uh, I wanted to ask you about equipment. Do you always play the same horn, or are there? Do you switch horns for different colors or different operas, or it's usually the same equipment? Uh, I've played you know several horns over the years. When I started, I started on a single F horn, then I went to a Yamaha double, a Geyer style Yamaha mm -hmm. with this mouthpiece, a Yamaha 30C4. Mm -hmm. Then I changed mouthpieces to a Paxman mm -hmm. mouthpiece, <clears throat> deeper cup and also wider. It was 18 millimeter cup, uh, the, the width of the you know inner, inner rim diameter, the 18 millimeters and then when I, I, I used that mouthpiece for a long time. Then when I went to the US, I had to leave the, the Yamaha here because it belongs to the Music Institute. So I, I borrowed uh, a Con AD from Greg. So I played on a Con AD for one year. Then I bought a Con 20 AD from Greg. And that's the horn I played for close to four years. It's a great horn, I still have it. Uh, love that horn, great sound. And then I was using my Paxman mouthpiece. Then when, when I took the Met audition, when I, when I started with the orchestra, uh, I said, well, I need a new horn because that, that con is, is old. It was getting old. It was made in 1951. And there were some things, you know, like the, the metal was wearing out in some spots. And I, I just didn't want to ruin it. Yeah. So I got a new horn. I got a, the horn that I have right now. It's a Patterson double horn, Geyer wrap. Uh, J James Patterson makes them in New Mexico, in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And then I switched from the Paxson mouthpiece to a Lollifant mouthpiece. But then the Paxman was 18 millimeters. The, the lolly fan that I switched to was 17 and a half. So that was a, a big adjustment for me to, to do here in my lips. And I mean, but, but it was great. You know, that there were things that got a lot better. Some others, you know, very challenging, but you can't find the perfect mouthpiece. You know, that's, that's something that it's impossible. That's true. And I, I, as, at least I believe that. So, and, but, you know, I, I still play on the, on the Patterson, but you know, about a month ago, I switched mouthpieces. Now I, I'm playing on a Joseph Clea mouthpiece, 18 millimeters. Again, I went back to 18. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've, I've been having a lot of fun. I actually ordered more mouthpieces from Lolly Fun. They're on their way over here, but 18 millimeters. It's because of my lips. You know, my lips are a, a little bigger than, you know, some others. 
Right. So it, 18 millimeters feels better, more comfortable for yeah. me. So, and yeah, that, that's what I play. I play in a Patterson and a Joseph Clear cup at mouthpiece right now. Nice. Now, can you yeah. talk a little bit about uh, what's going on right now? I mean, like you're, you're home in Costa Rica, you're practicing, you know, you're kind of like on standby, like the rest of the world is. Um, what, yeah, I mean, it's, wow. It's, you know, I, pretty much like everyone else, um, I'm, I'm at home and um, I'm trying to, I'm teaching a lot, lot more, I'm teaching a lot more than, than before. I'm teaching a lot of students here. Uh, students from from the U.S. I mean, I don't teach in a conservatory, but you know, I have students on the side. Um, so I'm doing a lot of virtual lessons. Um, I started these warm up sessions with uh, my Costa Rican horn friends mm -hmm. because I was feeling. I'm not gonna lie. I was feeling very demotivated about three months ago, and I just didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to practice. I didn't want to it really got me, you know, I was like, okay, I'm having trouble. I'm having trouble. I need to do something. Otherwise I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna do mentally well. Yeah. So I decided to start this warm up sessions with them at 8 a.m. every morning for, for, for about three months. We did it for three months. And then I had the idea to invite a, a friend of mine, a guest. And then we saw that that was a great idea. So we start, we kept inviting people and we had 31 guests for, you know, for a whole month, you know, right. 31 horn, you know, horn players. And they're also, uh, well, Mike Sachs was there. Uh, he was uh, there and Jose Siva as well was, was yeah. there in one of those. Yeah, it was great. You know, it was great just to be in close, you know, in interaction with them and hearing about their warm ups, the, what they do asking them about motivation too. And it, it was very inspiring. And with all that information, I've been trying to process it now. Yeah. And because yeah. we finished like a week and a half ago and it was great. I mean, you know, and I'm working on a couple of projects uh, that we're going to do socially distant, you mm -hmm. know, chamber music that we're hoping to um, broadcast in, in social media. And Today, I talked with uh, another musician that I'm going to, you know, it's a project that I've been working on for a long time and we're probably going to start it, but I, I can't say much. You can't say what it is yet. Uh, yeah. Well, but yeah, it's just, you know, teaching and, you know, trying to also biking a lot. I Going outdoors for me is, is, is very important and I live close to a mountain. So, I mean, there's a lot of spaces that you can go to without people with agglomerations of people. So I just go up the hill, bike, see cows instead of people. <laughs> that's good. So yeah, it's, it's, it's important right now to maintain the motivation. I mean, that's a little bit what these chats have been like. And I have, you know, I had Mike on last uh -huh. month and uh, yeah, I saw it. It was great. Yeah. It was, it was and, very interesting. And Jose, if he's watching, he knows he's coming on next month. So, awesome. but uh Great, man. Well, you know, any, anything else that, uh, is there anything that you can think of advice wise to students that like looking back at yourself, like five or six years ago, you would tell mm -hmm. yourself now that would be, be helpful or that you went, Oh, I didn't know I was going to need to know that kind of thing. Well, what I told uh, um, a student, I want to sort of, sort of embarrass myself, but I learned my lesson. You know, I didn't do a lot of the required work for my theory classes. And mm -hmm. uh, I regret it now because I, it would be a, a very useful tool, a very great thing to have right now. And so I wish I could have done that better. So my advice is just do all your classes, do all in all your classes, do all the assignments, um, listen to the people who are more experienced. Mm -hmm. um, try to look for advice. Don't be shy. Don't think that you have all the answers. No, you will learn the answer, the answers as you go in your life and have fun, you know, have fun and try to decide what's good for you, what's bad for you. And if, if you know something is bad, but you're having fun, try to think twice because that can 
take you take a lot of time from success you know like it will sort of go backwards once you're trying to achieve success yeah. it'll take you farther away so really think twice if if you feel comfortable if you're feeling like okay i'm, I'm doing taking it easy maybe it's time for you to rethink and you know what's the word Put, push on a little bit more we push on a little bit more. Yeah. Just to be more diligent, like try to ask yourself for the extra mile. Yeah. It will be and, really rewarding in the future. And what about one, one last question. Um, if you were going to tell a student five recordings they need to listen to mm -hmm. of anything, what do you think? Uh -huh. they would That's a hard question. I know. Five recordings like of anything of anything. Yeah. That, well, pertaining to horn, probably. Okay, well, I mean, well, some of them will be classical, but you know, yeah. a classic, Mahler III, Vienna Philharmonic, Claudio Abado. Uh, that's a great recording. Um, I like, you know, I, 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 there was a time in my life that I listened to uh, Metallica. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it just felt like something that I would go, you know, I listen to classical music, then I would listen to Metallica, but not met so I mean, listen to rock in general. But there was a C a salsa CD that um Jose recommended, it's called um Pasaporte Passport, yeah, it's by uh by um Antonio Abreu. It's, it, it's an incredible Cuban salsa group that is just it blew my mind so. And when you listen to that CD, that rec those recordings, you, you're going to hear so much joy, so much, uh, you know, happiness, so much things going on. And, and that will enhance your mood, hopefully. And you just want to do that with your playing when you're playing classical music. Keep things interesting. Keep things, um, you know, just lively. So Pasaporte by Antonio Abreu, Mahler III with Vienna. Um, there's a CD by the Vienna Philharmonic also, uh, playing excerpts from operas from Richard Strauss. I think it's called Rosenkavalier Capriccio and, and something else. That's a great, great album. Oh, is that the, uh, the Previn recording? Pre yes. That yeah, the Previn. Yeah. Recording. Yeah. The Rosenkavalier on that's out of Yeah. That, that's a great album, especially the, the moon music of the moon i think that, yeah. that that's very so nice yeah um uh, another recording or another album that i'm listened to you know for me th there was just it, it's an album that um by rolf schmedvig um playing trump trumpet and organ music mm-hmm it's just, I mean, that, for me, that, that, that was very inspiring when I heard it. So Is that the album with Prayer St. Gregory and all this? I can't remember the name of the organist, but, you know, just you know, you, to listen to a trumpet player playing at that level was very inspiring. So especially yeah. Rolf Smedvig. It, it, so trumpet with organ, Rolf Smedvig. And anything by Wynton Marsalis, you know, for me, any, any album by him. I don't, you know, I, I usually just... We went to Marsalis and, and I just click on whatever. Yeah. And, but, you know, the way he plays is it, just incredible. So, I mean, I, I, th there are a lot, of, a lot more recordings that I listen to, but I also like to listen to a lot of trumpet playing. And, and I like to listen to jazz because it's just contrasting to horn playing. And sometimes I want to do that when I'm playing horn. Not so much only horn, horn, horn. So much but listening in other, other, concepts help me to have a more diverse way of playing you know oh yeah no no the, all those are amazing examples that that previn recording i'll probably listen to tonight now that you brought it up because it's yeah because the, the music of the moon i think that's the yeah I, I can't say it in german i don't know german but that's actually a horn solo and that's just incredible and, and that, that's a great sound the vienna vienna horn sound yeah. uh Mahler third you know that horn sound you know it's just big and when, when it needs to be loud is there the, those are the contrasts that i want to hear and then winter marsalis is just a genius so yeah uh, that is true He's everything he does you know it's try to pay attention to it and try to do at, at least uh, 
0.5% of what he does in, in with the horn. <laughs> and then to listen to Wynton talk about music is also really important too. He's such a genius. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, he's, he's just a very, you know, what he has done for, you know, education, all the, um, well, what he has done, you know, for, from his side to music. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. So yeah, remember, anything by Wynton Marsalis is, yeah, is I great. Mean, I remember when I was in high school, I heard Empire Brass play and it was before Mark was in the group. Jeff Kernow was still playing trumpet. Oh, okay, nice. And Russ had just joined the group and Hartman and Palafium and, and Rolf, of course. Yeah. And he was totally on fire like that night, you know, like some nights on yeah. fire more than others, but he was really on fire. And mm -hmm. I remember them playing uh, The Bartered Bride, you know. Is that the one that... Uh, it was like all the double right. tongue. It was, you know, it was just crazy. G trumpet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, G trumpet, yeah, because yeah, I mean, the, the G trumpet, it's a color that I really enjoy yeah. listening to. But I remember him saying, uh, I really enjoyed playing this when I was in the Boston Symphony because it featured the string section. And then he played all the violin parts on the G trumpet. And it was like... Incredible. Yeah, just like having that, ver being versatile. And, and you know, yeah. not that I, I will sound like that, but I will at least try it, you know, try yeah. it. You know, have that reference and... And when, when the time comes to play something like that, then you have a good res reference to listen to. Yeah, It's not going to be just yourself trying to tell yourself, oh, this is the way we're going to do it. No, if you have a good reference, then you know, yeah. that's why I listen to a lot of great trumpet players too. Yeah, well, yeah. we like to listen to good horn players. I think that's why I like that Vienna album so much you mentioned because the- Yeah, it's, it's incredible. It's, it's all about sound, so. I think the first time I heard that, I about drove off the road because it was the Rosen Cavalier, the first time I'd heard it played like that. So you need to like really stop what you're doing and try to like enjoy. I mean, it, it's just incredible. I mean, yeah. so it's, uh, also, I mean, if I must say that there is an album by, by the Met, you know, the Wagner overtures with the Met Orchestra and Levine. That's a yeah. great album. It, it's uh, so it's, I, I actually listened to it a lot, you know, when I was preparing for the audition and it's just the sound of the orchestra is great. So, I mean, again, there are a lot of other recordings that I can mention, but if I had to say, you know, those, yeah, those are the ones that. Well, the Met always sounds great and, and the horns always sound fantastic. And the second trumpet playing is outstanding if Jim's listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, uh, sometimes, sometimes, not just kidding. <laughs> sometimes it, it works out, it works out for them. Yeah, uh, but uh, anyway, well, look, it was a pleasure to have you on, and uh, thanks so much for doing this and yeah. making the time, and and hopefully, of my pleasure. Hopefully, we'll all be back doing what we should be doing. Exactly. Soon. Hopefully, sooner than later. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully, we can hang in New York City like, I like the last that. time we did. Yeah. The last time we did that was so fun, and uh, it was fun. The last time I saw you guys play, I'll tell you this story. Not that anybody's watching at this point. I hope not. But. I sat down and you guys were doing Turandot, right? Oh, nice. Yeah. And, I, and I sit down and the guy next to me, he brings, he's like a little bit older, but he has a really younger woman with him. And I'm trying to figure this whole thing out. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you know, the guy tells me, uh, I mean, he's getting really excited. At the end of the second act, you know, when like the, the big eye is kind of like, uh, it's played a little bit, but not sung yet, you know, like it is yeah. in the last act. He, uh, Ness and Dorm, I'm thinking of. The guy, you can just hear, he's like kind of humming along with it. He's getting really excited. And he says, uh, what? He's like, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a musician. Oh, yeah, me too, you know? And I'm like, okay, because everybody tells you that when you're a musician, right? And yeah. he says, oh, oh, yeah, all the time. oh, yeah. And he said, uh, I said, I said, what do you do? He says, well, I play piano and I play some jazz piano. And he said, I had to, he said, I teach a lot now, but I, w I was, I had to get out of the performing part for a while because I had a, a substance abuse problem. I said, oh, okay. And I thought that'd be the end of the conversation. And then he says, uh, yeah, I was Gloria Gaynor's music director from 1977 to 79. Do you know who Gloria Gaynor is? Gloria Gaynor. Gloria Gaynor. Do you know the song, I Will Survive? Uh-huh. That was Gloria Gaynor. She was a one-hit wonder. Oh, wow. So, so he was her music director when she was at the height of the disco era. And then he said, wow. I said, oh, I Let's could go. see how you could develop a problem in that period. 
<laughs> oh man, I mean, I, I'm not very familiar with that with that period of time, but I've definitely you know heard that song. That was yeah. that would probably it was before be, my time. That was oh, <laughs> it's uh, at the beginning of my time, but I I can imagine that'd be a nutty period to be, <laughs> yeah. you know, as you can imagine. That, it would be like let's not get into those details. Exactly, it was a lot of <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, uh, but anyway, thanks so much for doing this. I hope we see you in New York soon and uh, stay safe in Costa Rica. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Great. Yeah, a pleasure and take care. Thanks, buddy. We'll see you soon. Take care. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.